calls it sons of his sons to inherit and laid up for the righteous is the wealth that belongs to the sinner. Lord, you're a much better preacher than I am. Preach this in Jesus' name, amen. Tonight I'm talking to you about a few good men. A few good men. And I'm going to preach a little bit at an area that may bring a certain level of discomfort. But those are always the best messages, isn't it? It touches a place of, of vulnerability in your life. Um, and I've got to scoot around my scripture and come back to it in order for it to make sense to you. <laughs> my mother is here, my gorgeous mom. Wait, mom. That's my, that's my mother. And uh, she's saved, filled the Holy Ghost, tongue talk, and I love that lady, great grandmother. Um, she's an awesome lady. Her and I both were born in a mess already in progress. And uh, I uh, am a part of a, a strong uh, story in Chicago, and and there were things that happened to get happened to give me a very powerful foundation in the Lord, and I lived. Uh, long without death or any such uh, uh, traumas that would lead to death. And uh, in 2009, I was completing my, my doctorate degree in education and I was working in the public sector for a turnaround school, a turnaround organization uh, at the, the discretion of our mayor for bad schools uh, in the city of Chicago. And my job was to increase the likelihood of uh, success either by academics, behavioral, or standardized testing, etc., etc. So I was not in seminary at that point. I was in real school. And when I graduated, not that seminary was not real school, but I was in school for an, uh, an educational program. And uh, my graduation came in 2009. And I am the middle child of four uh, on my father's namesake. I am Matthew Lewis Stevenson III. He was junior. And at this juncture in 2009, my father and I, uh, I was the closest to my father of all of my siblings. And um, maybe earlier that year, probably about February, uh, my eldest brother, who had been missed for about 20 years, uh, got supernaturally, eerily found in a club in another part of, of the world. And because of how he looked, which is ironically how we met as the story goes, is that my mom and his mom uh, were on the CTA in the uh, early 80s and saw we look so much alike, they asked each other, who your baby daddy is? And you know, <laughs> found out we were real brothers. And uh, so he had been missing for about 20 years. My father had not seen him, family had not seen him. And in 2009, about February, we found him. And it started to relate to him. He flew in, he being my brother, to my house, spent the weekend with us. And uh, we got very acquainted. The weekend of my graduation party for my doctorate, uh, my father had been calling me every morning. Our custom was we talked at about five in the morning. At this point, he had been sending stuff. Now, the crazy thing is my mom will tell you, he didn't send me stuff in the mail. But he had uh, started to send my daughter things in the mail. He was a great grandfather, an amazing granddaddy. And uh, this weekend, we were we had a graduation party scheduled at Cooper's Hall. I graduated with my doctorate degree with all A's, 4.0, never made anything less than. And um, my father was on his way to Chicago from Norfolk, Virginia, uh, to celebrate with my wife and my family and I uh, my doctorate degree, the first in my family to complete uh, three degrees and to go forward. And he called me. What's old boy? You smoke crack, don't you? Um, you smoke crack. Joe Clark was his name for me. He called me Apostle Joe Clark uh, because he knew that I worked in the public school sector. And uh, the morning before uh, the graduation party, my dad called me at about five in the morning. My wife and I were laying in the bed, and I'm like, "What does he want?" He, you know, he was he was a man of many contradictions and dualisms, in that he was extremely mean. He would make fun of you. He had a major uh, comical personality. He would find something about you worth laughing at. But then he, he was one of the most affectionate men in the world. He was a very decorated uh, military man. Uh, he was a master sergeant and had spent all of my life in the army um, and had not even broken a bone, never been shot or any of that. And on this particular weekend, 
before heading to be with me for my doctorate degree graduation, he was at a neighbor's house and uh, a man fell in a drunken stutor, stupor and murdered my father, cold blood. This was not a war thing, this was a barbecue uh, over a political debate where a guy left the, the meeting after having watched me on YouTube and uh, went to go get a gun and shot my father repetitively over and over and over again. Uh, the day of my party, uh, my aunt called my phone and when I, it was about five in the morning, I'm thinking they're getting instructions for the party. And I pick up the phone and she wails and instantly I know something is wrong. She's like, your daddy is dead. I literally crawled up the stairs to my wife and could not even get it out that my father had been murdered because we were, I was the closest to him of my siblings. Um, went to my mom's job uh, and my mom and I, my mom is very excited about bad news. And um, I went with my mom to the job to let her know because they were very good friends still at this point in my adult life. And I did everything within me to conceal that something was wrong. And I guess it's just a mom's intuition. She came out of work and was skipping towards me and she got midway and she said, no, who is it? And when she said, who is it? I dropped a tear and I just said, my dad. And she went berserk. That was, in fact, the most, as a man acquainted with pain, that was the worst pain of my life. Um, a lot of things went around that particular issue, uh, but here's what made the pain worse. It'll make sense, is that uh, when my brother came, uh, the one who we had not seen, and then all of my other siblings came in, some of them stayed with me for the funeral. My father had a wife, and I'm hoping none of her relatives are in here tonight because I'm about to make you mad. My father had a wife. <laughs> and uh, we didn't really get along that well. Uh, you know, I, I, in my teenage years, when they were first married, one of the final times I experienced inebriation, which is a very intelligent word for drunk. Uh, I called her and gave her the word of the Lord. <laughs> And, and, and you know with prophetic people, we'll just be honest, when we were not saved, we were the best cursors. I mean, I could combine some phrases and words and thoughts. There was in fact an energy in my mouth that would make you feel anything. So we didn't really have a good relationship. It was a very traumatic thing. I was pastoring at this point, obviously had children. My wife was pregnant. Uh, uh, and uh, we had to have his wake at my church. Um, the first, my brother had been around me and my other brothers, but had not been reunited with my dad. And so his first time seeing my father after about 20 years would in fact be at his funeral. It was a very traumatic time. That was the wake at my church in the basement of all nations worship assembly. The next day, uh, my brothers were finding their way to me so we could all get into the limo. Uh, to head out to the funeral and uh, the, the wife decides to alter the funeral time so that we would miss the funeral and um, they had no children together she was a barren woman and myself and all of my siblings except for my baby sister were at the house and she moved the funeral time up so that we could miss it and so we got in the car and made it through the traffic through Aurora out to where my father was buried or was being buried. And we pulled up literally at the moment the preacher was letting him go to the ground. So we missed the funeral ceremony. Uh, we missed everything afterward. And there were people that I didn't even know um, behaving very dramatically around my father's death and falling out. I didn't even have the room to make my own scene. Um, <laughs> As a decorated war veteran, my father had three insurance policies totaling over $1.5 million. And um, his wife uh, called me one day and she said, you know, Buki, oh crap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, 
She called me by the name that my family refers to me as, and she said, please edit that. And she said, um, your daddy was so happy about you, but da da da. I'm gonna make sure, Paul, I spend this money well. The government will take care of you and your siblings. Um, trying to find the, the, the feelings at this point to be very transparent with you so that my message makes sense. I was making my own money. I was already at six figures, making more money than probably all of them. But to hear a woman articulate to me with evil intent that I would have no inheritance sent me into what I, the only thing I could liken it unto is the dark night of the soul in one minute. And I, in my past, I had experience with molestation. I had uh, uh, experiences with guns, all kind of stuff in my history. I had never felt more emasculated than that moment. And it would seem like going through sexual stuff and going through uh, stuff with high school and teachers and pastors that you would have a lot of other things that would try to prick your manhood. Nothing affected me like that cell conversation. Uh, because in that one moment, what the, what the way I processed that statement was, even with pastoring, with having my own children, my own wife, my own money, and, and being one in the 1% of African American males in the nation, being a doctor, I then felt like, what do you have to look forward to? My inheritance was in fact stolen from me. For about three years after that, I would go into a massive depression. I mean, emotional PTSD around the time that my father was murdered. And even the pain of missing the funeral and having to kind of co father my siblings and having to interpret all of that was not as bad as a woman being audacious enough to let me know I am taking your inheritance to spend it on whatever I choose. And maybe the veterans staff will pay your debt off. And they did to God be the glory. But uh, her statement to me was used by hell to literally almost mentally take me out of here. My ideas about God, my ideas about family, my ideas about purpose were all very much so scrambled and up until this point, I didn't realize how important the security of inheritance was. Yeah. Had you asked me before then if it mattered whether or not somebody had left something for me, I probably would have said, no, I've got my own stuff. And so it was not the money. It was the fact that when, in my estimation, a man is disciplined enough to work for a story, that they build for those that they are responsible for. And for that to be stolen in a moment is extremely traumatic. Um, God used that season in my life uh, to teach me about how and why inheritance would always be more than money. And he began to show me throughout the Bible about how there is a major amount of scriptures dedicated to these two words, heritage and inheritance. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, when you deal with Jesus Christ, for example, there are several scriptures in the Pauline epistles that talks about his inheritance amongst the saints. There are other stories in the word of God, uh, so much so, well, I'll show you tonight, that there were laws about inheritance. If I can just speak to you kind of prophetically, I think that one of the reasons why we need a fire conference and we need a gate network and we need a multipliers forum is because somewhere in our building and in our teaching and in our life coaching, we did not design inheritance. Things that people could look forward to. It almost became a matter of doing what you will, coming in where you fit in, and working hard for yourself. So we are in a season where nobody considers the subject of inheritance. And if you think about heritage, it has to do with your connections and your place in a story already in progress. So then, 
If you are an alienated, isolated, or excluded person from a broader body, the possibility of inheritance is impossible. Because in order to have inheritance, you've got to be connected. And your connection determines what your inheritance is. Does this make sense? Now, this scripture in Proverbs shows us that one of the vehicles that inheritance is experienced is by good men. Men who envelop or embody the goodness of God. And what they do is they make uh, 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 inheritance possible for people who otherwise would be excluded from inheritance. It's so bad out here for churches, for leaders, for preachers, that we have literally taken on the work of crafting our own inheritance and paying people to act like they did it. Come on, yeah. Go to Isaiah chapter 4, and this will explain our crisis further. In Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1, there is a very gruesome scripture that I think depicts what we're dealing with today with the subject of heritage and inheritance. And Isaiah 4 and 1 says this, In that day, seven women will take hold of one man, those that create inheritance, saying we will eat our own food, provide our own clothes, but only let us be called by your name to take away the shame of having been unmarried. My God. So th this crisis is that there was a time where people were so desperate for validity and so desperate for legitimacy and so desperate to be given the right to be who God called them to be that they referred to their leaders, their overseers, their backbones. You don't have to do a work. I'll grow on my own. I'll study on my own. I'll deliver myself. Just give me preferred seating when you're in the room. Give me a label, a stamp. Give me a logo, something to have a name. Because I don't have an inheritance. And this inheritance has made me vulnerable and susceptible to all kinds of issues as it relates to my future. If you're with me, Sam, I'm with you. Now, this conversation it deals with three things. The first one is the conversation of identity. Who you are. Because if that is in fact the most important thing you got on in the world is who you are. Satan is not more afraid of anything than your knowledge of and your relationship with who you are. And if you will be honest, all of your most gruesome attacks are not on your body. They are not on your money. They are not on your family. They are not on your sexuality. All of those come from the assault on your identity. If in fact Satan, glory to God, is able to persuade you that you are not who you are, then all of the other attacks are easy. But when you surrender your identity, you surrender your peace of mind. You surrender your standards. You surrender your security. You surrender your entitlements because all of it flows from who you are. Now, if you and I were at Starbucks right now, and if I asked you who you were, you would more than likely respond with what you do. Because we have been grafted to identify with what we do because the conversation about who we are is way too intimidating. And so because we've not had the power, the voice, the possibility, the grace to bring revelation on our identity, we gravitate to our ability because that ability makes us feel better about what we still don't know about ourselves. But if you look at the way it went with Jesus in this saga of inheritance and heritage, in Matthew chapter 4, God makes a, a public service announcement before he plants a church or ordains a leader or changes water to wine. God says, Behold! This is my son. Glory to God. This one is my son. Before he heals a body, before he does anything good, I'm going to affirm him 
him in who he is because y'all are going to attach to him based upon what he can do but you're also going to betray him because of what he can do so I'm going to lay a foundation in his future not in his ability but in his identity because ability will change but if I settle who I made him to be in the earth even the cross won't be able to rob him of who he is the spear that the Roman soldiers would put up in his side wouldn't be able to change who he was matter of fact who he was was made known in Isaiah 53 when the prophets foretold not what he would do but who he would be his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty God prince of peace everlasting father so I'm going to blow in his identity this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. You see, pleasing God is impossible for those who don't know who they are. Because your attempts to please him flow from an idolatrous place. By mimicking and mocking what's around you. And it's easy to copy you because being me is difficult. I've never seen a me before. So you provide me with the courage to be a thing. But tonight, this message of heritage and a few good men is digging in beyond your resume and beyond your Hebrew and beyond your Greek and beyond your sights and beyond your intelligence to who you are. God says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Here comes Slewfoot. Jesus has not experienced the deacon board dry him off good yet. And Slewfoot shows up and says, If you be, not if you do, not if you will, but if you are who God said you are, perform for me so that I can see if your identity is negotiable. This is why we are in a performance based Christianity that bases your purpose and bases your worth on how well you do whatever you do. It is a very talent driven culture because we have fallen into the trap of performance because we didn't allow him to settle our identity. Your identity must be settled before you start trying to change the world and take nations because later on in your success and in your building, Satan is not going to come for who you heal. He's not going to come for the buildings you build. He's going to say, if you are really the guy that God said you are, if you are really the father that they say you are, he's going to test your Sit down. When I'm ready to preach, I'm going to let you know. Everywhere in your life where you settled was an expression of what you believed about yourself. Come on now, Mr. Preach, it's me level. Come on, a few good men. Every area in your life where you were deceived has nothing to do with whether you love the Lord or not. And everything to do with whether or not God could get your life to agree with who you were going to be. Has to do with the type of churches you submit yourself to. Has to do with the hero mentalities you place upon yourself. And the perfectionism and the fear of failure. And the inability to make mistakes and recover. And the inability to move forward. That, those are not issues that flow from steel or ability or, or, or grace. It flows from what you believe about you and if the devil can confuse you about who you are he can put his hand in what you want he can put his hand in what you allow he can put his hand on who you connect to he can put his hands on what you think you need and what you think you can't go without the wall is over your identity people who don't know who they are can't connect to a heritage and therefore can have an inheritance. The second issue of this conversation is not just identity, it's instruction. Because your identity determines what you believe about what you need to know. When you are not okay with being instructed on the level of a king, then it means you're not suited for kingly responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. Now, everybody's walking in march with these pretty little pillows and swords. 
talking about being more than conquerors and you've yet to conquer anything. Much less more than conquer. It's because of our instruction or lack thereof. Ah, because there's a part of this thing called sonship that creates a sponge within you that postures yourself under the word and that's necessary for who you're evolving to. I'm going to get to my point. But it determines the level of instruction. Now let's set the record straight. You may need to know a little more than the person next to you. And you may need to know a little more than the person behind you. The difference is in where you're headed. You see, for people who don't have much to look forward to, God is way more welcoming of the margin of error and way more tolerant of the lacks of discipline. Let me give you my story. Before I got filled with the Holy Ghost for real, I was one of y'all, okay? I would drink and smoke blacks and go to uh, midnight musicals just like you. I promise you I would. And, uh, and, and, but something would happen. There was folk that was in way worse sin, according to me at least, than what I was in. And they would get up and they would sing and the glory would fall. People would scream. Victory laughs. I would get up and try to mock the same Thing, and it would be like nah, 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 nah. and I can I help you for years could not resolve why it seemed like God was so unfair and let them get away with crack and baby's mamas and lies and tax fraud and they still can flow in the anointing I so much as pass a red light and the Holy Ghost is wearing me out all night like don't you ever do that again matter of fact God was sending me back to folk to read and two, who I didn't do nothing wrong to. I could not resolve why his standard on my life was so unfair and so high. So for years I grieved because I could not be like them and could not behave like them and could not grow like them. God had me on a tight leash and before I found out who I was, it used to fluster me. Used to irritate me. Why their test would last two days and the victory would come. <laughs> My test would be whole years long and I would be like, God, get me out. I'm not saying I'm talking to the person next to you. You're being fake right now. Anybody in here ever been like, God, why is this test so long? Well, I know this is a trial, but what are you trying to prove? I'm doing the best I got. Anybody in here ever said, why me? I found that your inheritance determines the level of your instruction. It determines why you got to go through a season of regurgitation. A, a, a detox of the foolishness that's been preached at you. A detox and a nausea of the theologies that were drilled in your head that make you think you don't deserve to do miracles. That's the job of preachers yoked up in commas. You don't deserve to flow in power. You sit there and you wait your turn and don't you dare tell me you called to preach because then I'm going to give you a practice sermon and I'm going to judge whether I like it or not and I'm going to give you a license although those ain't in the Bible and I'm going to make sure that you front around for another two years to see if you're really ready for this jelly and to make sure you can handle what God called you to be but when you fool around and stumble into a conference on the likes of these that give you the permission to explore who you are and to believe where you're headed your identity starts to erupt and whether you like it or not your instruction has to change who you are determines what you need to know but who you are also determines what you want to know I'm talking to people in there that's sitting in dead churches asking the wrong questions. You see them like, why do we still have this sick and shut in list? Why is our only idea of deliverance people falling on the floor? I don't understand why the preacher's kids are the baddest in the church. You're sitting there all kind of uncomfortable. Like, am I in the right? I mean, is anybody ever going to prophesy? I mean, you're sitting there frustrated. What's happening now is there's a DNA that's screaming to get out and screaming to be unlocked. And there is an inheritance that's starting to wake up in the inside of you. Shout hallelujah. Boy, I'm working in here. You know, DNA 
DNA is one of those things you can't fake. It ends up telling on itself. So there, there's a time where your instruction level starts to change. You graduate in the revelation that you need. And it's based upon inheritance. Just track with me. So number one, we got identity. Number two, we got the level of instruction. But then we've got the thing, the ultimate objective of the whole point, which is inheritance. What you've got to look forward to. You see, to this movement of churches, it's not about getting famous. It's not even about starting something. It's, it's it, to us, Apostle Dumas, it's, it's a little deeper than that. Yeah. Ooh, to us, it's about giving people something to look forward yes, to. Because you can't have a real conversation about the future and not talk about inheritance. So the real truth is that we have been a season where inheritance has been under attack. People have made you feel like you got to mop your way into an inheritance. Or you got to clean somebody's boot on your way to inheritance. People have made you feel like your only way into inheritance is after somebody dies. And after I leave, then, but that's a religious paradigm about inheritance that mandates that one person dies to bring you into your place. But in this kingdom model, we all enjoy our inheritance together. You don't just create successors in the event that you're going to need them. You create several functioning successors if you intend to go up. Now I'm going to hit you. The only person who does not pour everything they got into at least somebody is the person that intends to not go to a future. You see, the reason why people make successors is because they know I am planning to be promoted. And there's going to be one day and one season and one moment where I will not be doing what I'm doing. And so I've got to groom them on the way and train them on the way and impart to them on the way because I'm working myself out of a job and I'm creating an inheritance for folk who wouldn't have had one otherwise. Somebody say an inheritance. I, Apostle Raleigh, have found, to my horror, <laughs> to my utter dismay and chagrin often, that God has blew upon this network yeah. to gather the disenfranchised. I didn't know that's what was happening. I thought we were going to get a bunch of really refined, really well-presented experience, but it seemed like... Year four or five, it wasn't just 26 year olds, it was going to 40 year olds, and then it started with 70. Uh, but there was Fatima. There was something that joined all of us, no matter if we were from Kentucky or if we were from Baltimore, if we were from California, if we were from the west side, the south side, we were very different, but we were all very the same. You ready for this? In that we felt out of with what existed and something in us began to say you know what this is good this church thing is amazing but there has got to be oh you miss your cue you see I found out that God put that cry in everything assigned to this house the praise break is wonderful the tambourines are amazing I love the choir but there has got to be I know that there are those that have experienced God deliver folk from and even with that deliverance, there has got to be. So we are a nation of discontent people. We are a breed of uncomfortable people. And we are attempting to love each other in our discomfort. And in our discontentment. And in our hunger. That point shows us yes. that had we not joined yeah. together yeah. and had we not come under a common canopy, yeah. we would have had to create an inheritance. Uh -huh. 
an outcome, something to look forward to on our own. But it was never God's plan for you to make your future up as you go along. I'm talking to you and your mama. It was never God's plan for you to play the process of elimination and flirt and experiment with where you were headed. He wanted your footing to be sure. He didn't want you dating with options and roads and ways and lifestyles and, 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 and languages. There is a way that he's ordained for your life. The battle over inheritance is in the Old Testament. In the book of Numbers chapter 20 and 7. And it's a story where this issue of inheritance got so out of control. Because it was culturally accepted that if you're going to live and exist, it is unto something being released to me. Because the, 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 the thing you got to think about is whether or not you are a part of something that can release something to you. You'll get to tomorrow at coffee. If you are under something that has the authority to license a release to your life and your future. In Numbers 27, this is one of my favorite. I need some women to help me with this one. There was a man, the descendant of Manasseh, uh, who was the son of Joseph, and, and he died not in rebellion to God, but in his own sins. He was not judged. He just died. But this man did what all good men do. He worked to provide an inheritance, an outcome, something to release a place, a right to be. And this man died. But when he died, glory to God, he had no sons or those that were originally intended to have the inheritance, they were not there. So this is where the spirit of adoption actually started because those that should have gotten it, you better hear me, those that should have gotten it moved and didn't get it. And so the inheritance still existed even though there was nobody in place to receive. So one day a woman with an old ugly name her name was Hoga you know glory to God my preacher's at my hip now Hoga went up to Moses one day and said Moses look ugly and look there oh Moses <laughs> I tried to be intelligent but here come the ignorant black man Moses my father died as a man in his own sin and he was not in rebellion where the Lord pounded against the people that he had is going to be left to public aid is all your God concerned about is that my daddy had no sons I want you to go to your God and ask him if it's right that I have what should have went to them I feel this and the Bible says that Moses went to the holy place and in every other instance Moses had to make offerings before he got to God the Bible says in this book of Numbers that when Moses got to the door, God came out of the holy place and met him at the door. And before Moses could get the question out, God said the daughters of Zalopa had speak right. Give them their inheritance. I believe God is about to raise up people that were not intimidated or didn't hesitate to jump when they sued. And there are those and should get the place and they gonna miss it but there are those that's about to get under the poor and they're gonna get their inheritance shout hallelujah shout glory tell somebody I want my inheritance there are there are preachers prophets Evangelists, ministers, authors in this room, twiddle deacon and twiddle dummy, wasting precious time. And the harsh truth is, you've got nothing to look forward to. You've already gotten everything that you're going to get a dance, a skip, a shout. 
but you are a part of a system that refuses to release to you. And if it helps you to feel better, Pookie, Ray Ray, Nisi, and Nay Nay, you might be grieving unfairly because maybe the problem is not that these men and systems are withholding something for you. You ready? Maybe the real issue is they ain't got it to begin with. And you got to be willing in this Anglican church to sit there until you are ready to receive the thing Jesus wants you to have. Because there is a thing bigger than deliverance. And there is a thing bigger than healing. And there is a thing bigger than salvation. And it's called destiny. And you are about to find out why you were delivered. And why you were saved. And why you were resuscitated. And why mercy kept you alive. And why grace transformed you. Somebody say, give my inheritance. I want an inheritance. Oh my God. I want an inheritance. I don't want to make my own story up and then give it to a man once I've gotten successful because of my own rejection. I want an inheritance. I need something to look forward to. Ask me why. Uh, because without something to look forward to, I have no reason to endure. I have no reason to keep going. I have no reason to be consistent in prayer. I have no reason to read these books. I have no reason to finish this fast. Ah, but Jesus, come on, come on, come on, come on, clap, come on. Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him. Come on, talk to me. He endured. Can, can I preach my daddy in the house real quick? There is a level of endurance coming to you that you have never seen before in your life. And it ain't got nothing to do with alkaline water or oxygen. This endurance is coming because there is an inheritance lingering in the future and something you are going to walk into that mandates that you keep going. That mandates that you not fail. That mandates that you don't stop. We are sitting in houses and in denominations with nothing to look forward to. You are like me when my father's wife called me and said, you have nothing. He died for it. He built it. There is interest on it and I'm going to spend it on some weed. But Here's what God told me. When I came, I'm just be honest, I don't know how else to be. God said to me one day, I was in immense stomach pain on the side of my bed in anguish and God said, son, don't you realize that what this woman stole is going to curse her? Yeah. This preacher's getting real good now. He said, by the time you wouldn't have got it. It wouldn't have been good enough for you. Because what I've got for you. You missed your cue. <laughs> I said you missed your cue. What I've got for you. Has been accruing interest. That exceeds an insurance plan. It exceeds a GI bill. It exceeds a seat in a conference. It exceeds an ordination paper. This thing is an interest bearing account. And I'm watching you to see how you handle the pain of this apparent robbery and the pain of this apparent neglect because I've got something for you. God is concerned, Elder Torrin, about how many of believers around the world are living life with no anticipation of inheritance. With the harsh truth that nobody thought enough about them, maybe not as an individual, but about their outcome to labor today to bring a possibility for someone tomorrow. They're preaching, teaching. Nobody's given as much to look forward to. Inheritance has the power 
to change your world. Yeah. It can take you from a homeless virgin named Mary out of the ghettos of Nazareth to a woman who is favored among men. It can take you from a sex trafficked girl named Esther uh, who is escaped and who is snatched illegally and brought into the most prominent position in all of the kingdom where people are looking at you with your raped self, with your abandoned self, with your hurt self saying, who knows whether you came into the kingdom <laughs> for such a time as this. You see, because the truth about inheritance is that it is time sensitive. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that when an inheritance is gained too quickly, it brings a man into spoil. Because one of the factors about inheritance is that you've got to wait. You've got to have delayed gratification. You can't have everything you want when you want it. You can't have it manifest the moment that you claim it. Because God's got to cultivate the character for what he wants you to have. I'm not scared of you. God is preparing you to handle the thing your faith is about to release to you. And it's called your inheritance. Imagine life, ministry, marriage without something to look forward to. Something tangible. Imagine wasting years in environments that never clearly articulated what you would receive yeah. as a byproduct of your journey there. What happened to me on that phone felt like a dead end. Yeah. And I'm a prophet. I know who's in the room. Yeah. I thank you for coming here. Your registration meant the world. Go over there and help me buy my building, but... Are you at a dead end? Have you gotten all you going to get from where you at? Are you hurting because the real truth is you want fulfillment? Did you come here to receive an anesthesia from the reality of your world? Which is basically that this is going to be different variations of the same because there is no activation. There is no release. There is no opportunity. My only job in this context is to serve indefinitely. But nobody's talking about a future. Nobody's talking about a promise. Nobody's talking about prospering and flourishing. But the dangerous thing, here I go, with coming into the company of a few good men <laughs> is that one of the things God anoints us to do is put together the pieces of your story and we will find use in the most embarrassing details of your life it's a few good men that's who we are apostles yes prophets yes authors yes but who we really are is men who have the goodness of God in us and the way that expresses itself is it gives you a right hallelujah it gives you a reason watch me it gives you restoration it gives you restitution it gives you reconciliation it gives you right perspective it gives you freedom for a future we are a story being written we are a statement being made in this nation. We are a decision of God for this hour. We are a nation that will not be stopped. And what's driving us, what's moving us, what's pushing us is not a crowd. It's inheritance. We've got something to look forward to in every city we represent in this nation. This is not the end. Help me prophesy. February to go into a messy series called Abba. <laughs> Studying the reasons God loves to be called Father. 
and examining the challenges we have in responding as sons. Because we've been convinced out of inheritance. But he's given us the example of what it is not to have to deserve something, but just to have somebody do what is righteous and build a context for you to have. He says we don't have to cry out as abandoned orphans. You can cry out, Abba, because I gave you an inheritance. The Bible says while you were yet in sin, undecided, undelivered, unsanctified, I made a decision. I could run right there. I made a decision. Hey, I made a decision that didn't require your immediate. I made a decision. Is there anybody in here that's grateful for the decision God made on your behalf? It may have ended up in a divorce. It may have ended up in a breakup. It's for your deliverance When God makes a decision It's for your destiny Shout if you believe it Dangerous To be feared To be Terrified of It's the people Who have found a system A church A teaching that can give them an inheritance. That man is dangerous. Because now you are no longer a vagabond. A tumbleweed. Running from denomination to denomination. And city to city and bed to bed. And meeting to meeting. Looking for your fit. Now the good news is. You do not fit in everywhere. But you do fit in somewhere and when you find your fit look googly moogly I said when you find your fit when you find your language when you find your DNA you will look around at them people and say where have you been <laughs> all my life I wish I would have had a fire conference 10 years ago I wish I would have saw an elder I wouldn't have been in Atlanta holding around being sexually in the if I there is something dangerous when you find your inheritance. You are who you are. God has already put in you what he's put into you. But something about looking forward to the intangible benefits of an inheritance and the blessing of a birthright brings more to you than any amount of TV time you can have. <laughs> Knowing that I've got a right to be this favored. I could fall out, I promise you. I got a right to be this blessed. I'm subject to drive what I want, live where I want, make as much money as I want. And I'm not being haughty. I am an heir. And if I am an heir, then I deserve what Jesus did. Yes! Your understanding, I'm almost done. Woo. Your understanding of inheritance will determine what people can do to you. I have a really, probably because my mama's a smart aleck. My daddy had an anointed case of jerk. And those were impartations I received a double portion of. Uh, but God used it to my advantage. The scale, the scope of my mandate would require leather-like skin against disagreement and persecution. But in Colossians chapter 3 it says Everything you do Turn to somebody and tell me everything you do everything. Turn to the person behind you tell them everything you do everything. He says everything That you do Watch me I want you to do with all your strength As unto the Lord Knowing that from the Lord I'm ready to preach now You will receive an inheritance because what you make happen for them, <laughs> this, I'm telling you the secrets, this is my master class. 
but say, how did you do it? How did you stay in there? How did you last through all of that? I'm telling you, I never did it for y'all. I never stayed on that phone for y'all. I never preached for y'all. I never counseled for y'all. I never loved for y'all. But I made a decision that what I did for you was going to be unto him. Hallelujah! And what I did for them was going to be unto him. Because if I did it unto him, I know that can't nobody pay me back. Like the man that owns a cattle of a thousand here. You ain't got enough money to make me feel like my sacrifice is worthy. But now unto him who is I, I feel my help here to keep me from falling. I'm walking for my inheritance. Hallelujah! I feel a praise. You know that ball Hallelujah! So now, what good? What good is life without a promise? Is there a point? What good is a dream without a destination? What good is a focus without a landing point? When God starts doing dangerous stuff in your world and he wants to talk to you about what he's planned for you, he brings in your life a few good men. <laughs> men who don't aspire to be the next thing. I'm really not as excited about me as y'all are. Which is why they'll always have to convince me to take it serious because I would rather stay low than become puffed up. I'm not going to allow you to make me a god. So I'll keep playing small and being surprised when he brings it out big. But, 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 but you've got to realize when God sends a, a good man to you. Because the trait of a good man or a good church or a good fellowship is that they don't work for your survival. They work for your success. And so many of us are accustomed to surviving that we have lost the appetite for spiritual success. Emotional success. Relational success. Which is the byproduct of belonging to the right story. Your life is a sentence in a paragraph that God has already started to write. Yes. It's just a matter of punctuating it and getting in where you fit in. And right now, God is editing what you thought you knew about your story. I know, I know who I'm talking to. This is Samuel. Long head, don't care. God. <laughs> Most of you came here depressed. Because you wasn't where you thought you were going to be. You know, I don't have this by this and this by that. But every now and then, when a good man starts to preach to you, who knows the work of heritage and inheritance, and bringing a bunch of mutts together, and saying one mutt here can't do nothing. One mutt there can't make nothing move. One mutt over there nobody will pay attention to. But if I make a million mutt march, you better believe America will start to listen. Listen, let me tell you something. Don't let the PhD fool you. I've been anointed to collect the months <laughs> and to bring the abandoned and to bring the aborted and to bring the misfits and to bring the rejects into a house and to create a space for their expression and give them a right to be who God created them to be. It's All of the things God made us to be. Good men is one of them. And that's not nice men, it's good men. Because it's how God expresses goodness is by the power of adoption. Giving you access to what you couldn't have had access to had it not been for certain things. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children, his children. I'm going to give you one last scripture. And I want you to blow the roof off of this place. I was looking at the numbers tonight. 
the Holy Ghost started talking to me about had I fought in the flesh for an inheritance that truth be told I would have spent by now yeah. and allowed that thing to be the death of me I would have missed this and beyond because I would have gotten content with cash but I would have opted out of the crushing because I needed to feel what I felt I needed to have those dark moments of I'm mad at you why did you take my daddy from me I needed that it was unhealthy it wasn't right but God did not deliver me instantly because I needed to know what it is to be a base to be abound and what it was to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. If you are in here right now and you feel like you're going through hell, I've got a word for you. Keep on going because on the other side, I feel like I'm preaching now. On the other side of hell is inheritance, and on the other side of test is testimony, and on the other side of pain is promise. Shout hallelujah! Psalms 16 and verse 6 is my testimony of where I am in life right now with all things pertaining to me. I like it best in the English Standard Version, maybe it says, but you'll find so. <laughs> David said, the lines have fallen perfectly for me. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. He basically says, in retrospect, after having lost my son because of my adulterous affair, and having after been rejected by Jesse and Abinadab, and after having had my spiritual father, or who I thought was, come after me with staggers in my back. After having went through that, David says, I would not have traded yay, any of that for the world. Because now, turn to somebody, tell them right now. Go tell somebody at this very moment. David said, everything has fallen <laughs> right where I needed it to be. I was scared of them daggers. I was mad about my baby. I was mad when Jesse and Samuel took me to the Maury shore and denied me. But now that I look over my story, it needed to be that way. Because the line, come on and go with me. The lines have fallen right where I want them to. And indeed, somebody say indeed. Come on, say indeed. Somebody say indeed. I have a beautiful inheritance. And my future looks prettier today than what it did yesterday. My potential looks prettier today. that this is about dips and still new stuff for your resume. The real point is inheritance and what you're willing to do to get what God has planned for you. It's inheritance. No amount of stress can take you out. No amount of oppression and worry and insecurity. When you are inheritance driven, you submit. Yeah. You keep going. You obey. Because of what you've got to look forward to. You know who rebels? People that have no revelation of the future. Because you know God can't give it to you illegally. That's right. But obedience is born. When men have the revelation of inheritance. And every now and then, God will align you with a word, a story, a people that make you make sense. Yes, sir. Is there anybody in here that just didn't make sense? Yeah. Like you didn't make sense to you? Oh. I mean, <laughs> but God has 
as a way of joining strangers who can still make you make sense. <laughs> there were people in that deliverance room today that didn't know each other and next to somebody who was throwing up and speaking first century Aramaic in a tenor voice and yet it all made perfect sense because <laughs> now you can explain the stuff that you were feeling should be and you have seen in 3D. There were those of you that were in Prophetess Keisha's class who felt that prayer wheel turn in you for the first time for real and when you wanted to let go of that thing it just would not retreat. It made you make sense. There were those of you in that healing class that didn't know it was that easy to heal. You were taught it had to be difficult and toilsome and you had to grieve and groan and spit and laugh and foam and this woman all the way from Georgia walks up on you and says no baby it's as easy as one to two and it made you make sense. This is the hour when God's gonna make you make sense. You're not weird. You're not strange. You're not even really different. You just ain't found your fit. But God's about to release a revival of heritage and belonging and connection and identity in you. So many times I was tempted to call my father's wife. This time in a sober stupor. And I asked my wife and children to leave the room so that I could express the sentiments of my heart. And ask the Holy Ghost to give me 30 minutes. Set the record straight. That, is strength. that the Lord with strength. Yeah. Yeah. This battle is not yours. Stand still <laughs> and see the salvation of the Lord. Because the enemy you see today, <laughs> you will never, 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 never see them again. For they will come before you one way, and they will flee seven ways. Because I'm giving you an inheritance. To somebody, I've got something to look forward to. That's why we do this. That's why we do what we do, how we do. We gotta give people something to look forward to. A good man, God is about to raise up in this nation. A revival of good men. Men to whom God expresses goodness. I mean, when you think about the goodness of God, it's always in the context of what he made possible for you. Good men are those that release possibilities. You were a six member storefront church being faithful to your few anointed but just hadn't got under the right oil That's it. That's it. and something changed with how you saw yourself how you saw your work what you thought cursed you you now see was a gift <laughs> and an anointing that made you what you see before you is not good looks and eloquence. It is the beginning of the manifestation of inheritance. One yes to God is like a thousand no's to the devil. And whatever the Lord is requiring of you to get to you like a conveyor belt out of heaven to earth, make up your mind. Yes. Whatever it takes, whatever it requires, I will never live another day outside of my inheritance. I'm, I'm not trying to start a riot, 
of this black man is looking forward to all God's got planned for me. I said, I'm looking forward. <laughs> Come on, encourage your sister. Tell him, I'm looking forward. Tell somebody, I'm looking forward. Come on. Somebody on your row is hopeless. They've been disqualified. They think that they gotta get it the hard way, but I heard God say, I'm about to give you impartation that's gonna take the hard way out of your story. And what it took us 10 years to do, you're gonna do it in 30 days. Tell somebody, I'm looking forward. Relationally, in, in your familial issue, in your ministerial career, in your music career, it may feel like nobody was responsible or focused enough to create inheritance. But I tell you the truth, as surely as Jesus is Lord, God has a way of making it up to you. When you live delivered, God gives you everything that's in his hand. No good thing will I withhold from those that walk before me. I break that orphan curse off of you. I command you to be healed from that abandonment. From that insecurity. It makes you feel like you've got to facade and fake and be the cool kid and the cool guy. And I release that essence of sonship to you. That you would no longer fight inheritance. God's been building something even for you. Glory to God. Even for you. Even for you. Walk in your moment to the person next to you I am not afraid of what's next you didn't mean that to somebody else I am not afraid of what's next now I want you to take a minute hold on take a minute and act like you in a storefront church with a wooden floor with rats having church next to the fried chicken and throw your head back like you got whiplash and give God praise for a few good men. <laughs> Somebody that cast the devil out of you. Somebody that felt like you were worth it. Somebody that made time. God is faithful. Praise him. God is faithful. Holy Beast. God is faithful. Come on, open your mouth. God is faithful. You don't have to get divorced. You don't even have to stay small. Come on, praise him. You don't have to live marginalized. You don't have
God starts making stuff happen for you in ways you can't even explain. They'll call you from across the waters and send you surprise money and show up saying, I've been watching you for years. <laughs> God has a way of making it work for you. If it can give you the courage to get where you belong. This thing is about inheritance. We have laid down our lives to open places and possibilities for people who otherwise would not have them. If you have ever been disqualified, ejected, rejected, excluded, welcome to the rest of your life. There is room at the cross for you. And I made this appeal once. I'm going to make it one more game. If you come in, you better come now. There is room. Good God. I said there's room. Come on, church. God is breaking the open spirit right now. In the name of Jesus, I command you to be healed. He's breaking it. I command you to be delivered. Come on, let these men get breakthrough. I command, come on. Let him heal you right now. You're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. Come on, don't move. You are accepted. You 
gonna have to do nothing more to get his approval. Do you want me to accept him? He's healing you right now from years of neglect and years of hurt. And you come on, you don't even know how to open your heart. Let them guards down. Let them talk to you heart to heart. Years and years and years and years and years. The spirit of torment is coming out of you right now. 